TCS members and friends to our TCS IBS seminar. Today, we have a pleasure of hosting Dr. Debashri Chaudhuri from Center for Nanotechnology, IIT Rurki in India. And our scientific host today is Professor Ora Entin Volman, who will introduce our speaker. Please. Okay, so Debashri and I got a PhD a degree in Papua University in 2010. It finished the work in 2015, I got a PhD in 2016. And from that time on, she spent time in the Indian, Indian Institute. She came to Israel to be a postdoc of the Anonaon in Nitz. It's uh, 2018, and from that time on, we have been ongoing uh, collaboration with uh, the Bachelor works on several different topics. But the topic of today, we have to do with our uh, spintronic business and answering a question that Robert asked me this morning, why should we look at thermoelectricity when the spin up with interaction is induced by some time dependent field. And the answer is that, uh, that it's currently rather uh, fashionable to do thermoelectricity under time driving. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea is that maybe you can beat the Carnot efficiency. Mm -hmm. So we did not, unfortunately. But uh, people are interested in those time-dependent problems. So we thought, because we have this experience with time-dependent spin orbital interaction, why don't we check what it does to the efficiency and the figure of merit of a thermoelectric device? And this is the topic. So please, be, be Bashri, nice to see you again. Yeah, hi, Wada. Thank you. Thank you for this nice introduction. So. Hopefully, I am audible. Yes, you are. Yes. yes. So, hi, this is Debashree. Today, I'm uh, going to talk about this thermoelectric transport driven by spin orbit coupling. So, this, uh, my talk is based on this work, this very recent work of ours. Uh, so, this got published in Physical Review B. Uh, and uh, and our collaborators for this paper uh, are Professor Orientin and Professor Amron Aharani. And so the outline of the talk is, uh, first I would like to give some background, that is the two main words in my title. So what is thermoelectricity and why, what is a spin orbit coupling and why do we need that? And then I would discuss our results, our systems and what happens to the thermoelectric coefficients when we use the spin orbit coupling to a two terminal system. And then of course, I would talk about very briefly about the efficiencies that uh, uh, comes into play in the system. So uh, the first thing that, uh, uh, what is thermoelectricity? So we are familiar with thermoelectric uh, properties from our school days. So, uh, so we know about the Zeebeck effect. So it's actually uh, when we have two type of metals and we make, make some connection between them. So some junctions between uh, uh, the two metals. Uh, so this uh, and keep these junctions at two different temperatures. So if we do that then and make a circuit, then we can have a current flow in the circuit. So this is the Zeebeck effect and the reverse situation uh, arises for a Peltier effect. So we, we are familiar with that, but what happens to a two terminal junction? So I would uh, stick to the two terminal junction because uh, I will use it uh, while uh, explaining our results. So in, in case of a two terminal junction, we have a system. This uh, is some kind of a mesoscopic system for our case. And uh, it is connected to two reservoirs. These two reservoirs are kept at two different temperatures uh, that I have denoted by this TL and TR for the left uh, temperature and the right temperature and two different chemical potentials. These are denoted by mu L and mu R. So in this situation, two different kind of uh, uh, 
currents can uh, comes into play. So the first current is the uh, particle current that is denoted by JN, and the second current um, uh, is the energy current. So uh, these currents can be written. Uh, I mean, if we have uh, write uh, these currents in terms of uh, some linear uh, forces, like uh, here, what are the thermoelectric or uh, the, uh, I mean, the forces that act in this junction, that is the difference in the temperature and the difference in the chemical potential. So uh, in terms of these driving forces, one can write these currents uh, in the linear response region. By linear response, I mean that uh, the we would stick to the terms that are linearly dependent on that uh, driving forces. So if we do that, then one can write this JN and JQ in terms of this driving forces. This V here denoted uh, as the difference between the chemical potentials and delta T here is the difference between the uh, uh, temperatures. And we have a matrix. So this is a very well-known matrix. This is the Onziger matrix and the matrix elements are <clears throat> very much, in, uh, I, I mean, uh, these are related to the thermoelectric coefficients so this uh, diagonal uh, matrix elements are, are basically related to the thermal, uh, sorry, the electrical conductivity and the thermal conduct, uh, conductance. And that off diagonal terms are basically related to the Zeebeck and Peltier coefficients. And for a, a time reversal invariant system where time reversal symmetry is intact, this uh, off diagonal elements um, are equal. So, so we have the uh, matrix elements and we can define this uh, Zeebeck coefficient and thermal conductance from these relations. Now, uh, one can also give a measure of this thermoelectricity by calculating the figure of merit. So the figure of merit is a ratio between the thermal power and the uh, thermal conductivity. So uh, in a situation when we can increase the uh, Zeebeck coefficient or we can decrease the thermal conductance or both together, this would be a situation favorable for the thermoelectric uh, thermoelectricity. So this is our main goal to uh, somehow increase this uh, Zeebeck coefficient somehow and uh, uh, decrease the thermal conductance by some means. So this is a, a brief introduction on thermoelectricity. So next I would uh, go to the spin orbit coupling case. Now, as the name suggests, spin orbit coupling is the coupling between the spin and orbital angular momentum of electron. So uh, uh, as we can remember that uh, from the Dirac equation, if we want to have a semi-classical Hamiltonian from Dirac equation, one can uh, go through the poldi and transformation. This is a transformation by applying which one can have a semi-classical or low energy Hamiltonian from the Dirac equation. And if we do so, uh, we have a kinetic term, a potential term, and also a third term, which is uh, the some sigma dot E cross P term. So this E is the uh, gradient of this potential. So uh, this uh, could be some external electric field. And if we calculate uh, this term separately, this E cross P, it gives you some kind of a orbital angular momentum. So this is the term where sigma dot um, orbital angular momentum, that means it's a spin orbit coupling term. So a similar term uh, arises for a 2D uh, electron gas or, uh, or semiconductors. Uh, which we call as Rashba spin orbit coupling term, uh, which uh, arises mm -hmm. as some alpha r multiplied with the sigma x p y minus sigma y p x. Now, uh, now uh, note that from this term, the term I have mentioned above, if the electric field acts along the z direction, 
then uh, one can have a similar term as I have written for the Rajbak spin orbit coupling. So uh, this is also a spin orbit coupling term and uh, this Rajbak term can be controlled or tuned uh, with the help of some external electric field which is uh, very essential for some uh, experimental point of view or um, uh, also be useful for a uh, theoretical point of view as well. Uh, and there are plenty of papers where uh, people have done that already. So I am not mentioning that. But interestingly, there are certain properties that would be uh, that would be very beneficial for uh, the rest of my talk. And I would like to mention that. So this spin orbit coupling I have mentioned here basically uh, can be thought of, say, for example, if we start from this term, this sigma dot e cross p, and if I uh, uh, can visualize this e cross p as some magnetic field or some effective magnetic field, then this gives a, uh, a Zeeman-like term. So this sigma dot b effective. So uh, this this is also can be explained with the help of the relativistic effect when the electric field is Lorentz transformed to a magnetic field in the rest frame of the electron. So, uh, so basically, we are getting some Lorentz, uh, uh, sorry, uh, some Zeeman-like term. But importantly, for for a real magnetic field, we have some time reversal symmetry breaking. But here. Uh, because of the magnetic field is momentum dependent, uh, we don't have any time reversal symmetry breaking uh, possible here. So our system preserves the time reversal symmetry. So, okay. So now uh, suppose we have this two terminal setup and uh, your uh, these uh, junctions or weak links are coupled to some spin orbit coupling. Now the point is uh, whether we get some visible effect uh, with the spin orbit coupling in a two terminal junction. So uh, we, we can start from the very famous landau Grütikoff formula for conductance. So this actually, this T and T dagger are the uh, tunneling amplitudes. So let me briefly discuss uh, how to measure this T uh, in, in this two terminal junction. So this is uh, uh, mentioned in this paper very nicely. So I would briefly discuss that this actually, this T can be measured uh, by calculating the propagator, that is uh, the Green's function, and doing this integral. So uh, when we do that, this HK is the Hamiltonian for the electron within the weak link. So if we do so, then finally what we have, we have the tunneling amplitude is equal to some T0, which is the tunneling amplitude in the absence of spin orbit coupling multiplied by this phase factor. This phase factor uh, is, is uh, uh, this phase factor contains this sigma here, and this phase is called the arhanov kashuk phase. And now if we calculate this T, T dagger, which is needed for our conductance calculation, we simply have T0 square. So no visible effect is found for a two terminal junction uh, with a static spin orbit coupling. So what is the way out? So we want to have, uh, want to see the effect of the spin orbit coupling in this two terminal junction. So what are the way out? So the first, so, so the first uh, answer to this question uh, might be to add some, uh, so sorry, I forgot to mention that this is happening because uh, the spin orbit, uh, sorry, uh, in presence of spin orbit coupling, the time reversal symmetry is intact. So uh, because of that, we are getting this puzzle and uh, this situation. And this was uh, found by uh, Kramers. Uh, so he has so shown that this uh, 
the Kramer's degeneracy is related to this uh, uh, this uh, non broken time reversal symmetry and uh, for the two terminal junction. So I'm not going into the details, but let me let me answer the question that what is the way out and how can one uh, see the effect of uh, the spin orbit coupling in a two terminal junction. So the way out uh, one possibility is to break the time reversal symmetry with some magnetic field. But uh, uh, in a spintronics, which is the uh, spin-related electronics, it actually demands uh, the, uh, the effect of uh, spin orbit coupling rather the effect of magnetism. So because of that, this field is called the spintronics without magnetism. So we don't want to add some magnetic field here. So some uh, people add some third terminal in presence of magnetic field to have uh, a better situation. So uh, uh, we don't want that. We want to have some effect in the two terminal junction, very simple uh, two terminal junction. And the last is to use the time dependent spin orbit coupling. So this is uh, the thing we are interested in. So. So this uh, actually the motivation comes from this paper. So this is the paper from 2020 by Ora and uh, uh, Roberts and uh, Amnon uh, and also Johnson. Uh, so, uh, so they have shown some interesting properties uh, in presence of this time dependent uh, spin orbit coupling. So what they found is they have a two terminal junction and they are uh, imposing some time dependent spin orbit coupling in the weak link and what they get is so they are getting some uh, dc particle current in the system apart from the time dependent part uh, and this dc particle current they are getting they are getting that even if there is no biasing in the system and this is something interesting because uh, the particle current uh, to have a particle current in the system, there must be some biasing in the system. That is some difference in the chemical potential and some difference in the temperature. But here, what uh, they are getting is some DC, trans uh, DC current without any biasing. And this totally is arising because of the uh, spin orbit coupling, which is time dependent. So this is some kind of a motivation. And we uh, thought that why not we use the same formalism for uh, the energy transport and uh, have uh, the effects of uh, effects on these uh, thermoelectric coefficients. So uh, I come to uh, in the discussion of our system. So ours is the system uh, where we have the quantum dot is it's a single level quantum dot uh, and it is connected to two reservoirs via weak links mm -hmm. and the weak links uh, are, uh, are not, uh, you can definitely uh, have a mirror symmetric uh, system but here this dl is greater than dr these are the length of the uh, weak links in the two sides Definitely, you can consider DL equals to DR and have a mirror symmetric system. And what uh, we have is we are imposing some potential or electric field along the Z direction, um, which is time dependent. And uh, this electric field acts on the weak links. So because of that, we, we can have a spin orbit Hamiltonian, which have the time dependence in the form of the uh, periodic uh, kind of a time dependence. And also we have this KSO and M star. This KSO is the uh, spin orbit coupling parameter and this M star is the uh, effective mass. And uh, as I have mentioned previously, the of kasher effect comes into play and this, mo uh, this actually modifies your uh, uh, tunneling amplitudes. And uh, here, one thing we need to uh, mention that this Arhanov-Kasher phase for 
the left and right terminals are not the same they are different by a uh, by a sign okay okay so uh, there are some estimates that i have mentioned here so this kso that is one by length so this is uh, the uh, kind of a length of the uh, uh, spin orbit coupling parameter and also we have the effective mass uh, which is like this and definitely uh, as i have mentioned this dl can be considered as equal to dr or they could be different by the order should be same and uh, the frequency of the periodic driving is in the gigahertz that is in the microwave uh, frequency range and also we need uh, this epsilon d minus mu in, in uh, while uh, discussing our plots. So this is uh, in the uh, MEV range. So uh, these are the estimates for our results. Sorry, so may, let, may, yeah. just a question. Uh, in the previous slide that uh, I think I missed uh, some explanation why the phase factors the, for the left and the right uh, this uh, are the complex conjugate, why uh, uh, they uh, don't have the same yeah. factors? Yes, yes. So basically, uh, this uh, this can be found from uh, this, uh, this Z, that is the electric field that is uh, applying in the Z and, uh, so sorry, this uh, K, this momentum, that is actually in that dif uh, different direction, right? So because of that, we have a minus sign from there. Uh, sorry, that if uh, uh, this the left and the right uh, 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 junctions are, are uh, identical, then I expect that this the L and the R uh, stand for the direction of the propagation, where uh, it stands for the just the left and the right uh, junctions. No, no this L and R are the left and right junctions, and they are not directions. But here, uh, yeah. when we calculate the uh, triple product, triple vector product, then we need to uh, consider this uh, direction of the uh, electric field and the direction of the electron propagation. Yeah. yeah. You. <coughs> You apply the electric field uh, in the same direction for both the uh, junctions, right? Yeah, okay. okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but it depends the way on the way you define the tunneling of Newtonian. Yeah. If the tunneling of Newtonian is defined where the one part is always creating on the right and feeling uh, it on the left, then you can this way. Yeah. Okay. So always this. If you wish, the left electron comes yeah. from the left, and the right electron goes to the ground. So that's the moment. It's, it's, a, it's a convention, because you want to write the, the tunneling of the tunnel with something, you have permission to do it. You don't take it. Okay. okay. So uh, this is our system, the Hamiltonian for our system. So the Hamiltonian have, uh, it has three parts. So the first part is uh, from the central uh, quantum dot. And this epsilon D is the energy of the electron within the dot. Uh, and this D dagger and D are the creation and annihilation operators um, on the dot. And uh, we have some tunneling part, as I have mentioned previously, the spin orbit coupling only affects the tunneling uh, amplitudes. And uh, because of that, it becomes time dependent. And uh, we also have the uh, lead Hamiltonians uh, for the right lead and for the left lead. So uh, the tunneling Hamiltonian, as I have mentioned, that it, it is uh, modulated by this phase factor, which is an percussion phase. And also we have this uh, different uh, creation and annihilation operators. So, uh, so we are uh, in the position to calculate the particle and energy currents in the system. 
So the particle current, we know that uh, it's the time derivative of the uh, number operator. Uh, so if we are uh, calculating the particle current of the left lead, then it's the number operator of that lead. So uh, this is the process of calculating the particle current. And also for the energy current, uh, we can calculate by uh, the time derivative of the each part of the Hamiltonian. So if we are interested in calculating the uh, energy current for the left lead, then we use the uh, time derivative of the uh, left lead Hamiltonian. And similarly for the tunneling part of the Hamiltonian, we have a uh, energy current for that and also for the central part that is the quantum dot. Now what we do, we use the keldish prince function formalism to calculate the proper expression for the uh, currents, but uh, I have not shown that part here. Uh, so the keldish prince functions are uh, uh, defined as the uh, quantum average of the two operators like this. So we use that, but uh, finally, we I am going to show you the results for the average current. Now, uh, what kind of average we are taking? We are taking some uh, uh, average over a single period. Uh, so, so after this averaging, uh, we have some average particle current and uh, we have some interesting properties of that. <laughs> so one thing I would like to uh, mention here that uh, as in our case, uh, both the spin orbit coupling parameter and the uh, frequency of the external field are is small, so we we have considered the terms up to second order in both of them. So finally, we have these two terms in the average uh, particle current, and the first term is the usual term where we uh, define this F R and F L as the Fermi functions of the right and left lead, uh, left reservoir. And uh, d omega is uh, a bright figure uh, kind of a, a term. Uh, simply, we need to have a gamma in the upside. And uh, to do so, we can divide it by gamma. And we have a gamma in the uh, uh, numerator. OK. So this, this is the usual term we get for a two-terminal junction uh, without spin orbit coupling. But here we have an other factor because of the spin orbit coupling. Now, interestingly, uh, if we have uh, FL and FR are equal to F, that is, we don't have any biasing and the, we have equal temperatures and equal chemical potentials on both sides. So what happens then? The first term goes away, but the second term still exists if dr is not equal to dl. So uh, this dr and dl, as I have mentioned previously, they are basically uh, the length of the weak link. Uh, and uh, so this shows that if we have some mirror symmetry breaking in the system, we have some uh, uh, average particle current in the system. So this is the result uh, here uh, shown here in this paper. So they are also getting some uh, DC particle current in the, and they have not uh, averaged the uh, particle current, but although they are getting the similar result that uh, for a uh, for a unbiased junction, they are, they are getting some uh, particle current. Now what happens when dr is equal to dl? So if dr is equal to dl and fl is not equal to fr, then we have uh, both the terms, but if both of them are satisfied simultaneously, then we don't have any particle current in the system. So these are the findings from this particle current. Now I move towards the average energy current. So here also. What is big uh, omega? Big omega, what is big omega? Sorry? Go back. Big omega. Big omega, omega. What, okay. So this is the frequency of the time dependent uh, electric field that we are applying. And so because our spin orbit coupling is time dependent, as I have mentioned previously. So this is yes, the and small omega is just energy. No, it's yeah. 
it's a, a small omega in your formula is just uh, integration over energy. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I come to uh, the average energy current. So here uh, we had we a question. Yeah. So in the formula that you have shown, I mean, you didn't discuss it, but maybe just to understand, are you basically just taking the uh, one loop uh, diagrams in your Kelvish uh, formulas to get omega square terms? Is uh, that no. 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 Okay, so what are you doing additionally? It shows the kind of independent equation motion from the Kelvin-Sagrange function. I see. And so yeah. this is an example. Yeah, but it is a very simple problem. Okay. I, I always say, action. Right. If you're applying the external electric field, or what is the total number of electrons during, during Sorry, the period? Say it again, I can't hear you properly. But the, the new system is the total number of uh, electron per the inside of the quantum that is conserved or changed. Mm -hmm. If you assume that in the two leaps, the two leaps are equilibrium, this is the main assumption on those families. So you are the in the function. It's on the number of people just for the dimension. You assume the chemical potential. And different chemical potential yeah. and different chemical It's low enough variation. Sorry, may I also ask one question? What, here in this expression, uh, you have uh, gamma L, gamma R, and also the gamma in the function D. Or, or what? Uh, it is some. Some. I can't hear properly actually. So, so uh, please continue. It's, yes, it's a puzzle. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, so in in terms of the average part uh, energy current. So, as I have mentioned in uh, in a slide before, that we have different parts of the energy current. So, these are uh, left lead energy current the tunneling energy current and the quantum uh, dot energy current. But uh, fortunately, uh, all other energy fluxes boils down to zero when averaged over a single period. Only the left over energy current is the, um, uh, is the uh, lead energy current. Uh, so uh, this is the average lead energy current and we have these three terms. So uh, these two terms, are very similar to the uh, particle current. Uh, I have written here for, for uh, the comparison that uh, this, these two terms are very similar to these two terms here. But the difference is here we have an extra factor of uh, energy uh, in this, these two terms. But apart from that, we have some PL, yeah. which is the power. Uh, we have a question. Question. I yes. noticed that your term, I mean, due to spin orbit interaction, proportional to second derivative of density of states. So, unusual thermoelectric effects as proportional to first derivative density of states. So, it's uh, supposed to be a small effect or not? I mean, oh, it depends, of course. In a resonant transmission, it's not. I mean, yeah, definitely it's a very small effect. Demand more, more quick dependence. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to be sure that it, it's a yeah, additional high, effect, but very small. Yeah. The thermoelectric effect. Yes. In this respect. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so um, should I continue? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. So uh, apart from these two terms, we have another term which is PL, 
this is the power that the spin orbit coupling supplied towards the leaf okay and uh, this gives the form like this now let us compare uh, term by term the particle current and the energy current so in the previous papers many of the previous papers have shown that the energy current of the lead should resemble the particle current apart from having a uh, an extra factor of energy in the integration but here unfortunately or fortunately we are get, getting some extra another term that is pl and uh, we are contradicting uh, many of the previous papers so uh, this pl here um, actually only have the uh, right fermi function and not the left fermi function so let us uh, uh, let us uh, discuss the same uh, conditions like when fl is equal to fr what happens so uh, without any biasing we have uh, this term goes away and here it depends on the values of dr and dl but this pl stays there uh, still uh, if there is not any biasing in the system and uh, what happens when both of them are simultaneously satisfied like dl is equal to dr and fl is equal to fr then these two term goes away but we still have this pl that is uh, 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 that is different from the uh, particle current case so uh, these are the findings from the uh, average particle uh, and energy currents now uh, we have in our hand the average particle current and average uh, energy current and we will use that for the linear response regime so what is the linear response regime as i have mentioned previously so it, it's actually uh, the mechanism to have uh, the uh, i mean the currents in terms of the driving forces and the first order of the driving forces that is linear order of the driving forces and to do that we use uh, the uh, we uh, actually expand the fermi functions in like this and if we do so we finally have the particle current and the heat current which is basically the energy current uh, minus some mu l nl dot so uh, if we do so we have these two terms as the currents and they are dependent on the driving forces now importantly uh, this in terms of the driving forces, it actually satisfies the uh, Onziger relations, uh, but this PL does not have any terms uh, related to the driving forces. So, uh, but apart from that, it actually satisfies the Onziger relations. And this I012 are the uh, uh, integra integrals and which involves the uh, KSO factor. This KSO is basically defined as the combination of this capital omega, small KSO, and D. So all the tunable parameters in our system. So uh, now we need to calculate or do the integrals. So we did that uh, for uh, for the numerical numerically, and also we uh, analytically have. Uh, calculated these integrals by using low temperature and high temperature approximations uh, to calculate the Zeebeck and thermal conductivities. So the Zeebeck and thermal conductivities one can calculate from these formulas and these also related to the integrals. So these integrals now uh, we will show the plots for uh, the Zeebeck and uh, thermal conductance for uh, three different conditions. The first one is numerically, the second one is for the low temperature, and the third one is for the high temperature case. So these are the plots. So the left plot is the plot for the Zeebeck coefficient for beta epsilon d minus mu. So as you can see, this uh, as these uh, blue plots 
these are for the numerical one. So uh, the first thin blue plot, this is basically uh, when we have this spin orbit coupling is zero in the system. So we have a plot like this. Now for the thick plot, we have uh, a non-zero spin orbit coupling. And uh, one can see that when this beta epsilon d minus mu um, cross a value like uh, 6.5, it actually the, uh, the civic uh, coefficient for spin orbit coupling breaks uh, the uh, other one. That is, it increases from the other one uh, when we are in the regime uh, greater than 6 point. So this is a result. Also for the low temperature case, which is shown here for the rate curve, uh, the thin one is for the zero spin orbit coupling and the thick one is uh, with uh, non-zero spin orbit coupling. And as you can see that it increases for, uh, for a lower value of beta epsilon d minus mu and it increases than the uh, non-zero, I mean, zero spin orbit coupling case. Okay, for, but for the high temperature limit, we get something different. Uh, so uh, we don't want to use the high temperature limit case uh, for the for the Zeebeck or for the thermal conductance. So uh, for the thermal conductance as well, as you can see the numerical results. Uh, so uh, this, thin plot is for the KSO equal to zero case, and this is KSO equal to non-zero case. And it shows a very small region where the KSO equal to non-zero case is shows some uh, negative uh, value, that is it decreases with uh, spin orbit coupling. And for this small region, we get uh, a region like this, where u is basically beta epsilon d minus mu. And uh, we get this region for where uh, this thermal conductivity decreases. So also for a uh, low temperature limit, we have the thermal conductivity decreases for a very small region. You can see here, it's, I hope it is visible. Uh, the upper one is for case equal to zero case and the lower one is case non-zero case. But for the high temperature case, uh, we get some opposite result at the starting. So we are not interested in the high temperature case. So basically, uh, so we can say that although the Zeebeck coefficient is very much, uh, 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 I mean, it's very much uh, increasing the uh, Zeebeck coefficient in presence of uh, spin orbit coupling, but we are not getting a uh, similar effect. I mean, the decreased uh, thermal conductance uh, for a wide region uh, uh, with beta epsilon d minus mu. Okay. So, chemical potential is the constant parameter or Temperature depend on the function. Which may have a chemical potential, but the chemical potential is a function of the temperature. Temperature is the temperature potential and beta is the somewhat. This is a small little bit. Small potential. Small. You can consider temperature much smaller than chemical potentials. Uh, you can neglect it. Yeah. I think coherent versus. Yeah. Uh, she could continue. Uh, yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So now I, I would uh, talk about the efficiencies for this two terminal junction. So um, so we know about uh, certain definition for the efficiencies. So for a heat engine, the efficiency is basically what you get by what you pay. So uh, 
uh, in case of the, our system, it's basically the electric power divided by the heat current. Now, um, for our heat engine, we all know that uh, the maximum um, achievable efficiency is the Carnot efficiency, and it is given by 1 minus Tc by Th, where Tc is the cold, uh, temperature of the cold reservoir, and the Th is the temperature of the hot reservoir. And for the heat pump, the reverse situation arises, like uh, we can define it uh, like a heat current by electrical power. Okay. So uh, in our case, uh, as I have mentioned in the last slide, that uh, it's actually the P divided by the QL dot. Now um, we can, we have all the expression for P and QL dot, and we have uh, written it, the heat, if, uh, the efficiency for the heat engine like this. Now, uh, for this efficiency of the heat engine, one should note that for a heat engine, heat flows from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. And because of that, the QL dot we consider is negative. So, uh, so this is the case. And for the heat pump, uh, the QL dot is positive because from the cold reservoir, uh, heat is flowing to the hot reservoir. It's the uh, it's the mechanism for a refrigerator. So uh, the reverse uh, formula is applicable for this heat pump, and we have a definition for the heat pump and cal uh, in terms of the uh, integrals. Okay. Now let me uh, uh, discuss this efficiency in terms of the uh, entropy production rate. So the heat, uh, heat engine efficiency can be written as having a Carnot part. This is the Carnot efficiency. And plus some other part. This uh, part is uh, written in terms of this entropy production rate plus the power. And here for the heat pump also, we have the first term that is uh, for the uh, Carnot efficiency for the refrigerator and the second part. Now, uh, in, in this paper, this is a very interesting paper in uh, that is published in 2022. The authors have shown that uh, they are beating the Carnot efficiency when they have some periodically driven chiral conductors. So uh, we are interested in this kind of, a, uh, I mean, beating of Carnot efficiency in, the, in this two terminal junction. So because of that, we uh, invested some time uh, for the second part, whether, whether this is contributing uh, some extra positive factor to this uh, efficiencies, because we have this plus sign here. So, uh, because of that, we investigated that entropy production, which is basically uh, the energy or heat current divided by the corresponding temperature. So if we do so, we can have an expression for Ts dot. So this is a long expression. So this first and second term, this eventually gives you a single term if you replace this beta by beta L plus beta R by two. This is the common uh, temperature of the junction. So uh, this gives you some, uh, some uh, one factor and with some power. And this power in our case is always positive. So this term is positive. Now we go to the second term. Now the second term, this last bracket is some uh, whole square term. So this must be positive. And this term, the uh, first term uh, here is actually related to the thermal conductance. And the thermal conductance for, a, uh, for this case can't be negative. So this whole term becomes positive. So this Ts dot, and this actually gives you P when you apply apply the beta equal to beta L plus beta R by 2. This gives you a P. Now, uh, from that, 
you can calculate this ts dot minus p as some positive value. Now, if we replace here, it actually gives you some negative value. And because of that, we are not uh, uh, getting this uh, higher efficiency than the Carnot case in our system. But uh, because in this paper, the authors have uh, this chiral conductors, which they have created with the help of the, some topological material. So because of that, they are getting uh, some kind of a, a Carnot efficiency. And they are also getting uh, the uh, entropy production is less than zero in some cases. So uh, uh, using the Clausius formula, but uh, we are not getting that. In our case, uh, the entropy production is always positive. And because of that, we are uh, always our efficiency is less than the Carnot, but definitely uh, without this spin orbit coupling case, uh, what people have as efficiency, we are getting better than that, but not higher than the Carnot. So, so let me summarize my talk here. So I have discussed the two terminal systems and uh, driven by the spin orbit coupling. Uh, so uh, we have considered the time-driven case because uh, without time driving, the system has a spin uh, time reversal symmetry and the time reversal symmetry actually show, uh, prevents some kind of spin effect, uh, showing off some uh, effect of the spin orbit coupling in the uh, tunneling amplitudes. And we have the particle and energy fluxes, the average one. And uh, we showed that the particle and energy fluxes are not uh, related only by a factor of the uh, energy, but we still have some other factor, which is uh, the power developed by the source of the time, uh, time dependent spin orbit coupling towards the leads. And also um, we have shown uh, the uh, efficiencies that are uh, although below the Carnot, but still we can improve them with the help of the spin orbit coupling. So thank you. Thank you, Debashri, for this nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Yes, please. I have one question and one comment. The question is, uh, if you you have time-dependent electric field, I mean, to generate spin orbit interaction, and actually you choose linearly polarized uh, electric field it's on the same direction, hmm. would you, ex you, your electric field is time-dependent and always align along the Z direction? Yes, yes. So if you have two components, for example, electric field Z and Y, and both are time dependent, so it's okay. a circular polarized light. Uh, so Ora and Avron has papers on that, the elliptical polarized uh, light. They have considered that, but for not this case. Uh, so there are papers for that also. My question is, would it affect at all, I mean, your uh, results if you have circularly polarized view. Do you yes. have any idea about this? It will. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, it needs to be considered, yes? Yeah, it needs to be considered, but it will. Yeah. But I have also one comment. You, your um, uh, response to spin orbit interaction, interestingly, proportional to second derivative of density of states. And this opened the interesting room for using superconductors. If you consider quasi-particle in superconductor, they have a singularity or density of states on the gap or H. Okay. And if you take second derivative, usually it's first derivative and it's a, it's a effect stronger, but not so strong. Your effect would be even stronger since you the singularity should be differentiated even more. I mean, about this. So maybe you would affect, due to your spin orbit, 
you will have uh, thermal transport by quasi-particles in superconductor anomalously big. That would be very bad. Yeah. Huh? That would be very bad. Because the only way to get to get high efficiency is to have high uh, Z coefficient and low yeah, it's, and low uh, thermal maybe it's, it would be bad, but I think it would be interesting effect. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Uh, for efficiency at the moment. But yeah, I but in this in this uh, well. I know if that we wanted to, to increase the efficiency. I, I know that people discuss thermoelectric transport and superconductor because of this singularity. And usually in metals, effect of thermal transport is T over epsilon Fermi. Right, right. Uh, but this is much stronger. So you increase the thermal conductance, but mm -hmm. then, you know, at the end of the day, the thermal conductance no, of I'm not saying that look how it affects. Uh, it is that it affects to, to the wrong uh, direction. But uh, at the end okay. of the day, even if you talk about thermal conducting, you have to take into account components. But other cross effects and in the Z Yeah. This that, is that's this not known to us. We, we cannot uh, judge anything without considering all effects and yeah, yeah. how it will, but I don't know we, we need to consider all together. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I'm not sure, but because uh, as the Bashi showed, uh, the current does not have this uh, power, I mean, the, the factory power. And the feedback, you can, uh, you can do this from the factory power, and the coefficients of the temperature. Do, do, do you know any effect on thermoelectric, thermoelectricity in usual case? Of magnetic field, of magnetic field, any effect. Yeah, I literally you know the, the Z back and the fake field has a very definite relation, but if you work on the then they are different. One, uh, the minus B of the other. Is it big if you go to the scale of this effect? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, please. Uh, for me, it's still kind of impressive that uh, in this case, when almost all parameters are degenerate, uh, the current of particles reduces to the difference in the lengths of your weak lengths. Uh, is there some deeper physical insight uh, beyond there must be some symmetry breaking in this? Is there that some uh, maybe number of Landauer, cha Landauer channels is different, or maybe uh, because of the difference lengths, the time dependent action of electric field did some additional job in one uh, weak link than in, in another. What is what is behind that effect? It, it's, it's rather simple. If you if you look at the the DC current that we got when it from spin orbit, it's simply because the spin orbit breaks the Let's try to. So what? So it's better to go to the left and to the right. It doesn't break time with those, but it's, it's okay. it break this. So this in some sense, it's, it's, it's uh, better to go to the left than to the right. And if you have, why is it uh, exposed in that way? If it is better to go to the left to the right, then I would expect the same effect different effect if the lengths are the same. No, it depends upon the if the two weak links are exactly the same links, then you don't break anything and you don't get the DC current out of the time dependent thing still so, over. But if one is longer than the other, so it depends which one is longer. Yes, that, 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 that's what I meant. So yeah. action of this uh, effect is proportional to the length of the of the Thank you. Okay. May I ask should a question just to, to be sure if I understand correctly that uh, since that the, uh, uh, the presence of the quantum dot is important in your model, if you remove this quantum dot and simply uh, uh, connect the left and the right reservoir uh, by your shoot uh, uh, link, then you don't get the uh, DC efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. DC efficiency. This is related to the property that Robert pointed out. 
that the effect is due. What he calls the density of state, meaning the density of state of the dot, the bright big number mm -hmm. This effect is related to the second derivative of the bright big resonant, which of course exists only because of the dot. I see. I see. Yes. Uh, you have considered an interaction of uh, particles on a quantum dot. What effects could you expect from the interaction interacting electrons and quantum dot in your system? Yeah, that would be complicated because uh, <laughs> we have considered a very simple setup. So because of that, we have not considered these interactions. Uh, so one could al also include that if you want. My question is to get to understand this uh, L is formula that you have written, which is proportional to omega squared. So, uh, as was mentioned, this was an exact solution to the uh, Keldish Green's Green's function equation. So yeah. I'm just trying to understand how starting from an exponential time exponential dependence on omega, like your time dependence was exponential of omega t, right? Yeah. From there, how do you end up with a uh, simple quadratic? So dependence? we have considered these uh, uh, terms up to the second order of this. So we have some, uh, we have expanded the, uh, I mean, uh, omega so terms. Yeah. Then you expand up to. Since we average over the period, uh -huh. you see uh, the, the quantities that the batch are calculated are only average over the period of movement. And then in that period, we assume that the frequency is small enough to for other by the It's not that you cannot calculate, calculate it, but Okay, do we have any other questions? Seems not. So in this case, let us thank the Bashiri again. Thank you. Thanks a lot.